Welcome to Denley Digital. So this is it. This is story time. So I'm going to tell the story about why I didn't get married and why I moved to Nevada. But in order to give you all the backstory, we're going to have to start with why I dropped out of college. But I'll be telling the story while riding around in the desert because that's just what I do around here. Okay, so first thing you need to know is that I struggled with what I guess you could call suicide ideation for most of my life, it seems like. I don't know, I always try to fit everything into categories and terms and everything, but basically it's as simple as there were things about my life that I did not like. and I was not inclined to continue living my life. But I hit rock bottom when I was in college. My third year in and I decided that was it. But then I started struggling with classes and stressing out over that. And I was like, if I'm going to end my life anyway, then why am I still stressing over this? You know, something wasn't quite adding up. So I stopped going to classes and I started feeling a little bit better. And I started to realize that although I couldn't do anything about what I didn't really like about my life in particular. Maybe there were some things that I could do to make my life more manageable. And one of those things, the first thing that I tried was to drop out of college. And that seemed counterintuitive because I had been raised to think that, like, it was an absolute necess necessity to go to college. But now I know better, not quite. I've done okay for myself without college. But that was when I decided that I would never attempt suicide until I've exhausted all of my options. Because I didn't do that before because dropping out of college was an option that I never even considered pursuing. But that was exactly what I needed. So ever since I've been living my life with that mentality that I would exhaust all my options whatever it took to make my life bearable. And it wasn't too long after that, that, you know, I started getting desperate again. Like, okay, what other options do I have? And I never, really thought much about therapy and psychology, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And I was very reluctant to open up to therapists, but I had an implicit trust in the institution of mental health because I knew they were bound by ethical guidelines and I even heard that, you know, that story about what were those brothers in California or something that they murdered somebody and their therapist couldn't testify against them because of patient confidentiality.
So I trusted that they had those ethical guidelines that they were bound by and they couldn't violate them without facing professional consequences. So much so that they wouldn't even testify against a murderer. But I mean, that whole point is so that people can trust therapists and see therapists and get help. But I realize now how naive I was. But I guess more about that later. So my struggle went on, you know, on and in and out of therapy as I got desperate. Didn't really have much faith in therapy, but you know, I promised myself I'd exhaust all my options. And things would eventually get better. I don't know if therapy was responsible for that. I don't think so. Sometimes some things get better with time. Some things don't. Some things get better with time very, very slowly. So, I guess fast forward to when I met Christy. And when I, when I started dating her, like she made a big deal about how she found me on the dating app. She picked me. You know, she's getting messages from all these different hundreds of people and she was just ignoring them, but she found me and she pursued me. But when we first started dating, I was, you know, all in. I asked her out in some grand gesture that I think was exactly what she was looking for. And it was really hard for me to do it's really outside my personality comfort zone. But that was, I think, exactly what she was looking for. And I just wanted to do something to show her how important she was to me and how much I wanted a relationship with her. Um, I was in therapy at the time going through a particular hard time, but maybe on the tail end of it. Except I would be coming into therapy like every other session in some kind of crisis because Christy was gonna leave me for some reason or another or something, some egregious thing that she perceived I did wrong and I was just confused by. So my therapist, he was basically telling me like, no, I'm, I'm scared for you. You know, you're here because you're struggling, but this relationship isn't helping because you're in a crisis mode all the time. And I'm afraid about what's gonna happen to you. But I was just so in love that I didn't wanna hear that. I wanted to believe that I could make things work with Christy. I wanted to believe that I knew better than my therapist. But eventually my therapist, he actually uh, went to a new practice in the city of Chicago. He strongly urged me to find a new therapist, he even offered to see me at his new practice if I wanted to commute into the city.
but I was pretty much done with therapy at that point. I didn't really want it anymore, but it wasn't really an option anyway, because Christy flat out told me, no, you cannot see a therapist. Because he will tell you to leave me, just like your other therapist did. Because I was naive enough to share that with her, hoping that she might get the message and get her act together so that she wasn't dangerous to me. But that never really happened. But I wanted to hope because she told me all these terrible stories about terrible things that happened to her and terrible ways that she was treated and I wanted to believe that if I could just earn her trust that she would give me the benefit of the doubt and we would keep we would stop having these fights and all this drama with some perceived thing that I did wrong But that was the last time I saw an individual therapist. But I guess probably even before that, because this would have been just weeks into our relationship. It would have been on October 17, 2016. So the early days of a relationship on my birthday. So we were celebrating, having a good time, and she was recording our conversation she wasn't clear why but I didn't really think much of it but she asked me like what what is the the most dangerous thing that you've done or something like that and well that's disgusting yeah most reckless thing maybe I don't know but I tell this story from like years earlier that from when I was abusing pain medication and I took too many more than recommended pain pills because well I mean I just mostly wanted to get high, I guess. Also, to help me sleep, because that's why I would often abuse pain pills, would be to self-medicate to help me sleep. But mostly earlier, like my college days and stuff. Obviously, you know, I know better now that stupid idea because how addictive it is, but at the same time, I was pretty smart in managing the addiction. Never really got addicted. The most I ever used pain pills was when it was prescribed to me, and even then, I would take tolerance breaks to manage that. But this particular case, the story that Christy was soliciting from me, like I went out of my way to research dosages to make sure that I wouldn't accidentally kill myself or something, or or cause liver damage with the acetaminophen. So I dosed it out specifically to avoid accidentally killing myself. And then I even, you know, I didn't take it all at once. I took a little bit at a time just to make sure I didn't get in over my head. But, I don't know, maybe I wasn't telling the story very well, although I think I was pretty clear that it was not a suicide attempt, but as soon as I told the story, Chrissy immediately wanted to frame it that way. She's like, oh, that's a suicide No, what are you talking about? That wasn't my intent. Like, I, my actions definitely suggest otherwise. Like, objectively speaking, it was not a suicide attempt, but for whatever reason, she wanted to believe that it was. 
And I tried explaining to her, like, you can't tell me what my intentions were years before I even met you. But I was like, no, fuck it, you know. You could believe whatever you want, but the objective fact is, I have never tried to kill myself. And then just moved on, you know, changed the subject. And then she tells me, can you say the words, I tried to myself. And this is such an obvious contradiction to everything I had been saying. Like, why would she want me to say the opposite of everything I had been saying? But my immediate assumption, perception, whatever, was that she was, it was like challenging me because she thought I was in denial or something, couldn't admit it. So I simply recited the words she asked me to immediately, quickly, without even thinking about it, and then simply continued on what I was already saying when she had interrupted me. And then I think maybe a, a moment had gone by or maybe I saw her stop recording and I remembered that she was recording me. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, I only said those words because you asked me to. Those are not true. That is the opposite of everything I had been saying. If you go and share that recording with someone, you are straight up lying, out of context. I don't remember the exact words I said, but that was the gist of it. But I remember her exact words that she replied with were, too late, it's already recorded. So she showed complete and utter indifference to what the objective facts were, what I said my intentions were. She just had her false narrative that she wanted to believe and she got the recording saying the words that she dictated to me because those were the words that she were, was looking for me to say. In hindsight, she obviously wanted some kind of leverage or something on a recording. But when she said, too late, it's already recorded, I was freaking out. I was like, I don't know if I'm being paranoid, but this seems like some really crazy, seriously fucked up shit. So I told her, like, if you share that recording with anyone, you know, basically lying by taking it out of context, our relationship is over. In no uncertain terms. I, I don't know how I phrased that, you know, lying by taking it out of context or whatever, but I told her that if she did that, our relationship is over. And she just immediately just agreeably just said okay and in my mind from that moment on it was settled we had an understanding at least she was not gonna lie on me with that false recording and so that was 2016 Never discussed again, forgot all about it. Completely in the back of my mind. You know, not something I want to think about when I'm trying to make this relationship work. So I guess fast forward, you know, it was a very tumultuous, tumultuous, tumultuous relationship. Um, you know, lots of arguments, lots of confusion on my part. And I definitely had my moments where I had my doubts about our relationship, but never really gave up, always knew I wanted to make it work.
And eventually it occurred to me that things seemed to be going pretty well. You know, we had probably been fighting somewhat, but it didn't seem like if we, you know, if we had been fighting, it didn't seem like it was affecting me as much. I wouldn't go into crisis mode and uh, start thinking about dark thoughts as much because things seem to be getting better. So, things seem to be better. <clears throat> so I thought, great, you know, like that was what I was hoping for. My plan works. She trusts me now. So she wouldn't always assume the worst and, you know, and I could be her voice of reason. I suspect her mom was her voice of reason because her mom kind of told me how she would help me behind the scenes. I didn't think much of it at the time, but But I thought that now she trusted me enough that I could be that for her. And I felt confident enough that this was a new normal that I proposed. So we were engaged. And then COVID hit. We had to postpone our wedding, but I was still completely in, so much so that on our original wedding date, we were at the suburban Cook County Courthouse trying to get married. Now, unfortunately at the time, apparently that was like the only courthouse in the state that wasn't doing weddings at the time. I don't know, maybe we could have gone to a different courthouse or whatever, but our plans just kind of fell through. And, you know, just okay, we'll just reschedule the wedding. Oh, yeah, I guess I should probably talk about right off the bat in the beginning of our relationship. I straight up told her that I was terrified of a wedding. I wasn't terrified of getting married, but the wedding itself. Because I don't like weddings, I don't like social gatherings. But if I'm the center of attention, that's like a fucking nightmare for me. And I was up front with her from the beginning about that. But still, I mean, you know, like she had it in her mind that she wanted this storybook wedding and uh you know you only get one wedding i didn't want to ruin it for her. so i you know acquiesced to pretty much everything she wanted even when she started telling me these ambitious plans that she wanted to do for the wedding dance and you know anyone that knows me you know from high school and stuff like i i don't dance I didn't go to my prom even. Never even considered going to prom because I don't dance. Never have. But she told me that she wanted to do these really fancy dances and she wanted to take dancing lessons with me so we could learn it. And I cautioned her, like, and I told you how hard this wedding would be, how hard it would be for me to do a wedding. And, you know, some big fancy dance on top of that, that's just making a hard situation even worse. But, you know, I never really told her no about anything, really. But I wasn't about to tell her no 
on anything for her wedding. So I cautioned her how difficult it would be for me, but that I felt like things were going pretty well, so maybe I could handle it. So I would try for her. But dance lessons were kind of an eye opener for me because you know, we take lessons every week, I think, but it was really hit or miss. And I figured out that it seemed to be completely dependent on Christy's mood. If she was in a good mood, then we'd have fun and I'd do well. When she was in a bad mood, I'd struggle and we'd fight and it was just a terrible experience. And I realized how much Christie's mood affects the quality of my life. Like everything about me emotionally revolved around Christy. And it was a bit of a roller coaster at times. But I, if you ask Christy when the turmoil started, she would say it was the summer of 2020, I think. That's when she decided that I didn't love her. And that caught me by surprise. I was like, wait, you think I don't love you? Why do you think I don't love you? And she'd be like, well, we don't do anything. And I'd be like, it's the middle of a pandemic. What did you expect? But she even told her mom that, her mom confirmed to me that, yeah, even before, when I felt like we were struggling, she, and I think she did say that to me, like she told me like, you don't love me. And I kind of brushed it off. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're crazy. You just hit your head, head on straight and come back to me. I didn't tell her that exactly, but that was like my attitude. It was like, you know, we're engaged. I shouldn't need to go out of my way to prove my love for her. You know, what kind of precedent is she trying to set? Because like I said before, like my personality does not lend itself to grand emotional gestures of love. But I don't, I don't want to set expectations that high before the marriage and then I'm stuck my whole life struggling to prove to Christy that I still love her. So I was just hoping, you know, like I'd stay the course and hopefully she'd get back on course. But when I really started having my doubts was in September of 2020, when we went on a camping trip with a bunch of her friends with Vishla dogs. Because we had a Vishla dog named Cookie and it was a whole group of people with all different Vishla Hungarian pointer dogs. And so at this point, you know, during the pandemic, she's a photographer. She started um, seizing the opportunity of the pandemic. I guess the usual horse photographer was on hiatus or something. So she started shooting uh, horse shows, horse photography, and I would be helping her out with that. I was basically her assistant. And that's when I started to get into video. So when we were doing this camping trip with these Vishla dogs, you know, we were thinking I'd, I'd shoot video, she'd shoot photo, and you know, we'd uh, exercise our creativity and see what we could put together. But we even discussed beforehand how we had no obligations and we would see how things worked out. And if things, if things worked, if things seemed good, 
we would do it. Otherwise, you know, we had no obligations. And then, you know, in the as it was starting, I think, well, we had already camped, I think, when we were going to the beach. And she started, like, chewing me out because I didn't clean the lens after the last horse show. And, and I even told her, like, okay, you're right. I, you know, I'm not comfortable working with this camera equipment, but... Yeah, I used it. I could have done something to make sure it got clean. My bad. But then she got out of the car and she was just chewing me out to her friend as well. Even after I apologized, took responsibility, she's still trying to embarrass me in front of her friend. You know, could you believe what he did? He did. He didn't clean the lens and he's going to ruin my equipment and this stuff is expensive. And, so I was just like, well, you know, what the fuck? That was completely uncalled for. You don't need to embarrass me in front of your friends like that. Whether I'm your boyfriend or your fiance or assistant or what, that's just uncalled for. But she just refused to apologize, wouldn't acknowledge that she did anything wrong. And I was just like, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm done. I don't, I don't. I don't feel like doing this anymore, you know? You could do your thing. I'm just gonna hang out, keep to myself, and just try to get through this. Because, you know, I get social anxiety. I don't like social gatherings. Those things were a struggle for me, but I would do it for her. But then we were on the beach. She's still trying to get me to like shoot video or something. I'm just like, no, I said no. No means no. We had no obligations. I don't want to do it. But she'd be trying to embarrass me and then she actually resorted to straight up bullying me. Like stereotypical playground school bully. Like literally, she was saying, like, are you gonna cry now? Are you gonna cry now? And like, I'm embarrassed to admit, like, yeah, I was struggling to hold back tears. That's how embarrassed and upset that I was. Not just that I was being embarrassed in front of these, all these strangers that, you know, Christy's Vichla friends that maybe some of them I kind of knew, but um, it was just really embarrassing, awkward and uncomfortable. It was already, Uncomfortable for me to be there at all, but to have my fiance straight up bullying me like that in front of everybody on this beach So yeah, I just I left I went back to our camp left her alone on the beach I Could not be there anymore. I could not stand being there. I had to leave but of course, she was so upset, you know, like, you shouldn't have left me there. You can't do that. And and I think I even apologized. Yeah, okay, I, sh I shouldn't have left you there, but I could not handle being there. But, I mean, like, we were arguing about it, like, the whole way home. And she never apologized for straight up bullying me. And that's when I seriously started to have doubts that we had the partnership I thought we did. And that was when I realized that it wasn't really a healthy relationship. But I was all in though, so it was like I didn't know what to do at that point, but hope for a sign that that was it really was a healthy relationship, but I kind of lost faith at that point. And I probably got distant, you know, emotionally distant, hoping to see her give me some sign that it was a healthy relationship. But I think she sensed that I was pulling away so she just started acting out, I think.
you know, so we were, we were emotionally distant. And I remember there was one time I was trying to close that gap and we were in my office and I was like, and I, I, I straight up asked if we could cuddle, I think. I think that was even my exact words were cuddle. And she like recoiled from me, like she was disgusted by me. Like, no. And that was pretty hurtful. I was like, okay, I guess I gotta give her space. You know, supposed to be married in a few months, but. And then I think it was maybe the next day, maybe two days later, but we're going to bed and she says, I'm gonna sleep in the guest room because you won't cuddle me. And I just, my jaw dropped because I had asked her to cuddle and she said no and she even recoiled away from me in disgust. So I was like, yeah, I was giving her a distance. She said no, no means no. But I didn't even say anything because it was late. I was like, I'm not gonna fight, but um. And then just like when she said, you know, you don't love me. You know, when she says, I'm gonna go sleep in the guest room because you won't cuddle me. I was like, I'm just gonna stay the course and hope she gets her head on straight because that doesn't make any sense. But I think she probably kept it up for like a month before she had suggested couples therapy. And, you know, because of her whole, um, not wanting me to go to therapy thing, I didn't dare suggest it, but she brought it up and I jumped on that. I was like, yeah, I definitely want to do couples therapy just because I was hoping that she would get that voice of reason she needed because at this point, I don't think I need to go into details or try to try to explain why, but she was no longer talking to her mom at that point. So I kind of feel like maybe that's where she lost the plot because her mom was her voice of reason and she didn't have that voice of reason anymore. So, but so she suggested couples therapy and I picked the place. I picked a place that seemed female oriented because I was fine with giving her, you know, home court advantage, so to speak. Because I figured the truth should be pretty clear, you know, what the problem was to any mental health professional. I wasn't concerned about gender bias at the time. But she picked the therapist and she chose to see Donald Rossoff. And he was an intern, so he was not a licensed therapist. But I assumed that Christy wanted to see him to save money because I assumed that she would not want me to pay for it. Because although I'd buy the groceries and I'd pay the mortgage and put a roof over her head, but, uh, you know, when it came to purchases or services and stuff, and she, she didn't like me helping out. So I assumed that she was just trying to save some money by going with that intern therapist. In hindsight, maybe she thought he would be more easy to manipulate. But we were in couples therapy and it just seemed to be going nowhere. I mean, I did, I think we did one session and then we did our individual session. But our wedding date was looming, you know, fast approaching where you didn't seem to be making any progress. And I was just freaking out 
You know, like we're supposed to be starting to make wedding plans, but we're clearly not in a healthy relationship. There's no way I could go through the wedding at that point. So I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. But, um... Oh, low battery. Okay, so I was in a bad situation and I felt like it was college all over again. I felt like I needed to call off the wedding, but it was so hard to do. I felt like I couldn't do it unless it was a life and death situation. So I had to prove to myself that I had to call off the wedding because that was the only way forward. That was the only way I could survive this. So I ordered something on Amazon that could have been used for this plan I had. And it was only half the plan, it was just one of two things. But I ordered it on Amazon and the weekend before our second appointment together, You know, I take my Amazon package off, off the front porch and I leave. And then Christy, she sees me on the ring doorbell camera, I guess, grabbing this package and leaving. So she, she must have gone to my computer and looked up my Amazon purchases. And she must have maybe looked at my Google searches too. And then, of course, all hell broke loose. What ended up happening is pretty much exactly how I planned was I hit rock bottom and I called off the wedding. I told my mom the wedding isn't going to happen. And in my mind, once that was done, the wedding was off. And... When we were in couples therapy, she even agreed, yeah, we, there is no, there's not gonna be a wedding. We are in agreements. So crisis averted, you know, she took away that Amazon package. I didn't even open it, but she took it away. Not that I was gonna use it anyway at that point because the wedding was off. It served its purpose already. And I kind of knew that she was telling our couples therapist about all this stuff. And he even called me that, I think it was either Sunday or maybe that Monday. I think it was Sunday. And I just didn't answer, you know, like, I don't want to talk to him. I don't know what chrissy has been telling him, but I got nothing to say to him. And I definitely don't want to talk over the phone if he wanted to talk. He could have texted me. But then the next day on Monday, I get a cancellation notice for our couples therapy session on Wednesday. Because I guess what was happening is that Christy was trying to say, no, I'm not gonna go to couples therapy. You need to do therapy with Chris because he's gonna kill himself or something like that. But our couples therapist had already explained to us that he's not doing individual therapy. If we want individual therapy, we have to see somebody else. But Christy doesn't like to listen, so she said she wasn't gonna go, so Don canceled it. And then I texted him the next day after he tried to call me. So he knows I'm not out of touch. He was texting, conversing with me the next day. But, um, 
And he said, oh, no, no, it's still on. We're just doing going to do couples therapy as planned. I'm like, okay, whatever. But when we were in couples therapy, I mean, it was just, you know, business as usual. But then eventually he asked, he asked me, I think he might have asked me directly in like, oh, how was your weekend or what happened on your weekend or something like that. And I knew what he was fishing for, but I wasn't about to say anything. But then Christy said, why don't you tell him what you ordered on an Amazon? So because of what Christy said, I reluctantly mentioned that, but explain the whole situation. Like, no, it's, it's fine. It's over. Crisis averted, whatever. But I was a little bit afraid, you know, now once you say you order that, you know, like that could trigger mandatory reporting or whatever, but you know, all I could do is just try to explain the situation for what it was and hope that they use good judgment. But Christy had plans after that couples therapy appointment. She was going to have dinner with her photo mentor who was in her COVID bubble. So pretty much the only guy she would see besides me So right after couples therapy, she took off. And then maybe like a couple hours later or so, I get a call from Suma Karandakar. And Suma is the intern Donald Rossoff's supervisor. She kind of like runs the therapy practice. So of course I know what this is about, but I try to explain everything to her. Like, no, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Like, if I'm gonna kill myself, I'll go. You know, call 911 or something. I promise. You know, telling her whatever she needs to hear. And I did seem to, you know, satisfy her that I wasn't a suicide risk. And she seemed content to just leave it be. And then I think it was maybe like an hour later, the doorbell rings. Guess who it was? But I'll show you the body cam footage about how that went down. It is edited for time, but I think it's a fair representation. Hello. Hey, brother, what's going on? I'm uh, Officer Benavides, the Elton Police Department. Okay. Um, so the reason we're out here is uh, your your therapist called, and she just wanted us to come talk to you and make sure you're okay, man. Okay. Um, is it alright if we step in and talk to you? Yeah, but Perfect. this is gonna take my hand. I mean, it, it, it'll take as long as we, as, as long as we can just determine what's going on. Why do you think the therapist will call us out here? Because I was depressed and I was going through a hard time, and my girlfriend's for fiance, whatever. I don't even know what we are anymore. Was concerned, okay. but uh, it's before it's done with, it's over with. Okay. Um, when was that? Uh, Sunday. Sunday. Okay. Sunday, like into Monday or just Sunday? Or? Just Sunday. I mean, it's just, you know, like I've been depressed for almost my whole life. Okay. But um, it's gotten worse because she was, you know, leaving me, moving out, whatever, uh -huh. very stressful time. But I'm you know, working through it. A couple days ago, did you ever tell your girlfriend or whatever that you were going to commit suicide or kill yourself or anything No, like that? she saw something I ordered on Amazon. Okay, what was that? An oxygen mask, which she confiscated. Okay. Why did you purchase it? Because when I get depressed, I get some comfort from having the means to end it on hand. Okay. But And I've done that before. I did that. 
you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just something I do to help me cope, and I can understand that she was concerned, uh -huh. but no reason to be concerned. Okay. Are you here alone now? It was just yeah, she said she had an appointment, and that was right after our um, couples therapy, and okay. she didn't say where she was going, but she said she wanted to talk when she got back, and I don't know when she's getting back. Well, first of all, are you feeling suicidal right now? No. Are you feeling homicidal? No. Anything like that? No, I'm actually feeling a lot better. Okay. With you saying that that mask was purchased for those reasons and you wanted to have the means on hand and stuff like that, okay? I understand it's been confiscated, but to me, that sounds like... A, you know, a, at least recently you've been having thoughts. Yeah, about and I can understand that with the way someone might perceive that, but that was private. She okay. actually logged into my Amazon account to even mm -hmm. discover that. So I, I understand that's frustrating, um, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but at least for now, okay? And I want to move you through this as quick as possible. Okay, okay? great. Can I call an ambulance here? I so, so really we, do not want that. I already have this is okay, okay. already uncomfortable enough okay, right now. Okay, okay, okay. Well, we need to go up to the hospital one way or the other. Are you serious? Yeah. So this this how long is this gonna take? I mean, if we go up there, we we sit down, talk to someone, probably at most probably two hours, <laughs> unless they determine that you need some other form of care or something like that. But as long as you tell them what you were telling me and stuff like that, we should be good. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> Do I have to go in the squad car with you? Yes. Either squad car or ambulance, one of the two. Which one would you rather do? Let me make sure everything's locked. Okay. Hey, Chris. Chris. Can I just patch you down real quick? Go patch you down. All right. I'm not accusing you of anything. It's just policy, okay? Especially when you're not going in there handcuffed. I'll tell you about the process, dude. It can really be a quick process as long as you're cooperative with them, okay? Um, they're going to, when you get up there, they're going to have you put a gown on. You'll talk to them. Okay, and then, yeah, I know it sucks, but you just put a gown on, you talk to them. Am I coming home tonight? There's a good chance as long as you can tell oh, yeah. them what you told me. Let me check your left pocket. Probably going to have to follow up with your girlfriend because you probably shouldn't be in possession of the firearm that he owns. Oh, uh, no, not if he is buying masks for the express purpose of having no hand to yeah. possibly kill himself. Yeah. Okay, so you saw how that went down. But what you didn't see, because what I don't know yet at this point, is what information they were acting on. But I was forced to go to the hospital, the emergency room, which was the worst possible place to take me. But that's, I guess, where any police will take you because they don't know any better. But if you go to the emergency room, then you're just going to pay like thousands of dollars for them to babysit you until they could find somewhere with a mental health ward that they could place you at. But as you saw in the video, my expectations were that there was a real, very real possibility that I could go home that night. But it was very clear to me that that was never a possibility. Because the doctor, I, it wasn't even clear to me at the time that he was my doctor. Because he hardly talked to me at all. But he clearly had in his mind, no matter what I said, that he was going to force me into inpatient treatment. I don't know if it's something that Chad Benavidez said or if that's just what he does to any patient that gets classified by police as a suicidal subject. But they must have had me fill out the same risk assessment survey like 10 times. And I didn't understand why they kept asking these same questions over and over again. And then eventually, who must, who must have been the doctor, Dr. Roland Liang at Sherman Hospital, he comes up to me and he's like, do you want to fill this form out? And I'm like, not really. I filled that out like 10 times already. 
And he's like, well, if you want, I could fill it out for you. And I'm like, fine, you should know what my answers are by now. But I didn't really think much of it at the time, but this becomes relevant later. Because, I guess I'll tell you now, I eventually found out that when he committed himself to taking me to court for involuntary inpatient treatment, if I didn't voluntarily go, he used that risk assessment form that he filled out to justify it, but he did not fill out the same answers that I had filled it out with repeatedly. So he essentially forged my answers to justify forcing me into inpatient treatment. But I was stuck at Sherman all night until they transferred me to Glen Oaks the next day. And the whole thing was just a traumatic, unbearable experience. Being kept in the dark all the time and about what was going on. No one was telling me what anything or explaining to me why everything was happening or why they were making the decisions they were. I couldn't sleep because the windows were open all the time and they kept the doors open. They had to check on you every 15 minutes and I couldn't even get a room by myself. I had to sleep in a room with a, another patient. I mean, I had done group therapy before, so that aspect wasn't really new to me, but I hated being taken out of my house, especially when I got the contentious thing with Chrissy going on and they basically gave the house to her. Kicked me out of my own house and forced me into what is essentially torture only to get turned around and bill me for it later for all this medical treatment that I didn't need or want. And they take your phone away and you have no contact with the outside world. I couldn't even call out of work. Except we could, we could use a phone, but they would monitor our conversations. And it had to be like their hardwired phone, not our cell phone. So I couldn't get, you know, any of my phone numbers in my phone or anything. You know, I don't know anybody's phone number. But when Christy was talking to me in the hospital, you know, like I would be, because they're monitoring you and it was so stressful. Like I am just cracking up like, trying to hold it together. I feel like I'm gonna drop dead any moment from all this stress and just from being this terrible traumatic situation. Like, I don't know how I could get through this. But then I talked to Christy and she told me later that she could tell when they were monitoring because in her job, they monitored her phones too. And she could like hear a click or something you know, when they drop off and when they jump on. So she would be just yelling at me all out. I forget what she was yelling about, blaming me for this, blaming me for that. Like she was being like emotionally abusive when I'm sitting here just trying to keep it together so they don't have an excuse to keep me there longer. And she was just chewing me out. I would, I would even, I even hung up on her once.
And as I was putting the phone back on the hook, I could hear her at the top of her lungs. And I was just like, I hope the other nurses don't hear that and keep me here longer just to keep me away from her. So one night in Sherman Hospital and then five days at Glen Oaks, and then finally I get released, go back home to Christie, and I feel like, I think this conversation happened as soon as I got home, I was, I just went to the bathroom and as I was in the bathroom washing my hands, I told her like, I felt so out of place there, because I think I was the only one there that never tried to kill myself. And she says, well, wait, what about that time? What about that one time? I'm like, what one, what one time? What are you talking about? Like that time with the pills. And when she says that, you know, that reminds me of that conversation on October 17th, 2016, where she was recording that. But all I remember at first was I was perfectly clear that that was not a suicide attempt. You know, she wanted to believe it was or whatever, but I straight up told her that was not the case. And that's what I told her then after I got to the hospital. Like, no, I was very clear that was not a suicide attempt. And then she said, what if there's an audio recording showing otherwise? And immediately I respond like there can't be any recording because I never that's never happened. And I'm and then as I'm saying that I remember that she did record and she did ask me to say those words. So immediately I follow that with, you know, like there can't be any recording because I never said that. If there is any recording. It's taken out of context. And when I say that, she doesn't argue at all, so I think she knows what the truth is. I think she knew what the truth was all along. But then, you know, the wheels start turning in my head. Because I'm still wondering, like, how did this happen? Like, I wasn't suicidal. I, that should have been evident. So how could they force me into inpatient treatment like that? But then suddenly, when she starts talking about this suicide attempt that never happened, suddenly, things start seeming like they might make sense. So I right away asked her, like, Wait a second, did you report something about a, a previous suicide attempt? She's like, I, I don't know. And she said, like, oh, I didn't report anything to police. I'm like, well, did you report anything to Don? She's like, I didn't report anything to anybody. And I think, you know, I had my doubts about that statement. I was like... And I think I even might have asked, like, why would you want to lie about something like, you know, like, that's not, you can't build a relationship on top of a lie like that. And she's, no, I'm not lying. I never said anything to anyone. So I'm like, okay, if you say so, I mean, I'm trying to make this relationship work. So I kind of have to give her the benefit of the doubt if this relationship is going to work. If she's denying it, I can't prove it. <sighs> So I guess I just took her at her word at that point. You know, she didn't say anything. Okay. I don't have any reason to believe otherwise. So maybe it really is just because of my Amazon order. I don't know. Um, that's my last battery. So I guess I'll have to continue this tomorrow because it's still a bit of a story to left, left to tell. Ah. <sighs> to be continued, but it'll be instant for you. Okay, 
So, just got out of the hospital, had that conversation with Christy. That was the only time I ever heard anything about this alleged suicide attempt, any information about it, other than there allegedly being a suicide attempt. And the only time I ever heard anything about that recording, other than the time that it was made. But I give her the benefit of the doubt, take her for a word for it, and I'm still trying to figure out what happened, how I could end up getting forced into inpatient treatment strictly because of an Amazon order. So first thing I do is I submit a Freedom of Information Act request for the police report. And I think that that's like a week delay. It takes five business days to fulfill a Freedom of Information Act request. And as soon as I got it, I mean, there's two paragraphs that are redacted. And, I mean, I forget, I don't think it gave that timeline about who called who when. I think that was on the uh, clear and present danger form, which I don't have at that point. But what I take issue with immediately it is I see, you know, I was talking about stuff that he found out in that conversation with me, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he says that I have a prior suicide attempt. Like, the context is just that conversation with me, and then all of a sudden, that out of nowhere, no explanation where, where it came from, what that supposed suicide attempt was supposed to be, or what. I don't know why he would want to state it as a fact in the police report without even asking me, making, confirming with me that it is a fact. But Chad Benavidez had uh, given me his card when he made me come to the police station to uh, return, give him my FOI card or whatever. So I had his, you know, cell phone number and I texted him like, y you lied, you, this, w w where did that false information come from? And uh, his initial reply was that information came from the therapist of presumably Suma and Christy. Now at first, I think I was uh, interpreted that as like, yeah, that information is in general information, like the information the police report, but I asked specifically about that suicide attempt. So I think that was what his answer was addressing, although it wasn't 100% clear, but I think that he heard alleged suicide attempt from the therapist and from Christy, and he saw that as confirmation maybe, even though obviously it's a couple's therapist and that information could have been false information from the other half of the couple. But there's some back and forth with Chad Benavidez And he tries to defend himself saying, oh, well, it's like a game of telephone. You know, sometimes some information gets misconstrued along the way. But he basically admitted that the information that he simply reported as a fact had the credibility of a game of telephone. 
why he just decided to report that as a fact instead of actually citing his source or even citing Game of Telephone to give it its due credibility. He just stated as a fact. But then his idea of a correction is he submitted a supplemental report where he said that I took issue with that and wanted that ignored. As if that's supposed to be some kind of correction. You have Officer Chad Benavidez classifying me as a suicidal subject, saying I have a history of suicide attempts. And then after the fact, you have him saying, oh, well, I take issue with that. Um, I want that ignored. The person he classified as a suicidal subject is denying what he declared as a fact. And he thinks that's a correction. But, I mean, obviously I wanted to see what exactly he was adding to that police report. So I submit another Freedom of Information Act request and ask for everything in that report. So, another week delay. And they give me the supplemental report. And then he also, you know, in addition to saying that I want that ignored, he says that the accusation of the false suicide attempt was not relayed to the emergency room at Sherman Hospital, but yet they decided I need inpatient treatment anyway. As if that like confirms his decision. Of course he doesn't say what exactly was she, no actually I think he, he says at some point, maybe in that text conversation, oh no I just shared the stuff about the mask and that's, that's, that's the reason why but he doesn't give a full accounting of all the information shared, so who knows what he's telling them. He could be telling them simply that my therapist thinks I need inpatient treatments. Not my couple's therapist, my unlicensed couple's therapist, who I've had two sessions, three sessions if you include the individual one. Unlicensed therapist though, based on False information from Christie thinks I need inpatient treatments. Or that unlicensed therapist supervisor, based on what the unlicensed therapist says, thinks I need inpatient treatments. So the idea that that somehow confirms that Chad Benavides did the right thing is total bullshit. But even more so though, is when I was at Glen Oaks, I was told that the psychiatrist there, Dr. Akil Khan, I think is his name, um, apparently the topic of whether I was actually suicidal, must have come up in a meeting or something. Because from what I understood, this was directly referring to me, but he said that if I am sent there for treatment, that he can't just send me home. So even the psychiatrist at Glen Oaks refuses to make a judgment call for himself whether inpatient treatment is actually necessary. So do you really think that an ER doctor with no mental health profession, no mental health expertise at all, is gonna make that judgment call for himself? 
or do you think he's just gonna cover his ass and since I'm declared a suicidal subject, he's gonna find one way or another to justify passing me along to the next person. So, so I got the clear and present danger form and that I think was a little bit more informative probably because there weren't really any redactions to it. Still just history of suicide attempts just stated as a fact, no reference at all as to where that may have came from. No reference at all as to what credibility that accusation has, even though that alone is one of the checkboxes that they use to determine risk. But everyone just keeps blindly passing that along. Not only that, but they escalate the credibility all along the way. Like the therapist doesn't say that came from Christie, so all of a sudden that has a credibility of a therapist with direct observations in therapy. And then the police don't say, well, the therapist says this. The police just say, history of suicide attempts. It's a fact. So everyone along the way just keeps on escalating the credibility of the false information. But I also submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for that uh, body cam video, which you already saw. And they denied it at first. And I was reading like the laws that they cited for the Freedom of Information Act. And it was something like, you don't have a right to the video unless it relates to a complaint. So I filed a complaint saying simply that I was forced to go to the emergency room for an evaluation based on false information. And I talk a little bit about these independent investigations in my last video. So I won't get into too much detail about that, but um, Well, why don't I just show you the video from the interview with the independent investigator that was investigating my complaint against the Elgin Police Department. Um, a form that you filled out on February 10th, right? Oh, I didn't fill it out. I did sign it. That is my signature. But I only signed it because I was told my choice was either that or they would get a court order and I would be there longer. So I just wanted to get out there as soon as possible. And they assured me that I would not lose any rights, which was a lie. I lost all my Second Amendment rights. They took away my CCL, my FOID card and my firearm. Okay. And I won't be well, able to apply for a FOID card again for five years now. All right. So I guess what I'm trying to get at, this was done at, at Sherman? No, this was done at Glen Oaks. All right. So this was after the officer had dropped you off and he had left you at the hospital and they transported you from Sherman over to Glen Oaks? Yeah. And what I really wanted, because I got the ER notes from Sherman and the ER notes refer to a, uh, a, a petition insert but I haven't been able to get that petition inserts because the ER notes don't really give any kind of description about any kind of justification for imminent threat to myself. They even talk about in the ER, I think I, I provide you with ER notes, but they even talk about yep. like fantasy idea and non-serious plan, which are all very clearly not imminent threats. All right. 
So that's why I wanted to see the justification that Sherman was giving, because I don't know for sure what the police told Sherman, what false information they may have relayed. Did the person explain to you, not that it, from Glen Oaks, what the form meant? Um, not that I could recall. I just remember reading it and seeing voluntary and taking issue with that. Had you ever uh, signed one of these before in your life? No. Okay. <laughs> Never will again. Yeah, understood. <laughs> How long did they keep you at Glen Oaks? 48 hours? No, five, uh, five days. So I was, okay. I was out of my house for a total of six days. Not only that, but when I first got there, I mean, you know, before, before, when I signed that form, you know, he said, oh, well, if you, if you don't sign it, we'd have to go to get a court document or a court, whatever. And then it's, I had to be there. I think he said at least a week, maybe he said five days. I'm not sure, but, um, but that was the timetable I was looking at. And that was just, you know, unacceptable. You know, I have to get out of there sooner than that. That's why I signed the form. Sure. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be a few minutes into the video, uh, just because, um, I don't think we need to see him drive into your house. You know what I mean? It doesn't right. Matter. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. I've seen the video. Do the whole video, and I think it's about four, four minutes, five minutes into your, into your house. Okay. Okay. So is that the part where you said basically you were telling me that he didn't give you a choice about whether we're going or not? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't really clear, clear, hear clearly what you're saying, but you said something like, um, you're going to the hospital one way or another, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was when I, I was under the impression that I no longer had a choice, and I was being forced yeah. to go to the hospital. I mean, I guess in the broadest sense, you, you, would you kind of agree that in situations like this involving you or other people, that the goal is to make sure that you're safe? I mean, I get that that's the intent, but like, you know, like what I've kept on getting told, like what the doctor, Dr. Khan told me, like better safe than sorry. But it seems like everybody just discounts the harm that would be done by taking someone out of their house and holding them against their will. I mean, that is harmful. You know, it's like I, I get that maybe in some cases that might be necessary and for the, the best interest of the person. But I wasn't suicidal. So that was not the case here at all. I was just wondering what you thought about the way they treated you, understanding that they kind of got to go on, to a certain extent, a gut feeling, right? I mean, they got to kind of weigh the circumstances and do what they think is best for you. And I was wondering if that's what you thought happened that night. No, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I don't know what the law says, but I disagree, you know, gut feeling, you know, my rights should not be uh, infringed on because of a gut feeling, you know, like it should not happen unless they know that I'm an imminent threat to myself, which they, I don't think could demonstrate. It's pretty frustrating talking to officer Benavides or whatever, if I probably pronounce his name after the fact, because I mean, even if after I corrected him about how Suma is not my therapist, he still referred to her as my therapist, even after I corrected him. And that was very frustrating. And then, um, I don't know. It just felt like he was more interested in covering his own ass than actually trying to help me. When you said they forced you, they, you, you walked out voluntarily. I just want to make sure you're not saying, well, I didn't miss anything from the video or that there was something was hidden. They didn't grab you and drag you out or anything. No, they, they walked, didn't use force. They used threat of force, in my opinion. You know, like they said it was going to happen. They have guns and badges. If they say it's going to happen, then I know it's going to happen. Yeah, actually, on the way there, I specifically asked him where the line was crossed, that threshold of imminent, you know, imminent threats, whatever. Like, I, I directly asked him, like, you know, what what criteria resulted in this happening? And he wouldn't give me a specific answer. He basically said it was a judgment call. I mean, you know, like I said before, they definitely should have talked to Christy directly. You know, if everything is based on what Christy said. Where was Christy that night? She was, I think, having dinner with a friend, co-worker. Um, she left right after uh, a couple's therapy was over, and we were planning on having a prescribed conversation that our couple's therapist, Don Rossoff, prescribed us to have, but we never got that opportunity because we were interrupted by the police. The police showed up before she got home. Understood. 
I mean, I understand, like, the whole game of telephone thing, but I would really like to know, you know, like, who made the mistake, that whole history of suicides? You know, where did that originate from? Okay. Because, I mean, obviously, if, you know, that's not what Suma told Officer Benavidez, then that's on Officer Benavidez for getting that detail wrong. Or, but if Suma explicitly said that, then that should be on her, how she got that wrong. Because, I mean, this, you know, this should not be relying on a game of telephone like this. You know, it's the idea that, oh, it was just a miscommunication down the line. It's like, that shouldn't even be an issue. Let me do this. I'm going to put you on mute for one last second. Let me see if I can find an answer. All right, Chris. A um, couple things. Suma did tell that you had had prior suicide attempts to the officer. How this basically worked without going too much into it is Don went to her, his boss and said, hey, this is what I have. I'm concerned. What should I do? And the boss and talked to their legal representation and said, who told them to call the police. That's how it got to be the way it was. But, okay, so Suma specifically stated history of suicide attempts, but – then I guess this is outside of your investigation, but I'd really like to know where she got that from. Did uh, Don, Don get it wrong or did Christy get it wrong? Don reported it to her. How Don got that, that wasn't clear. And were you were you missing in action for a couple days from the house? There was some reference that you had left and nobody could find you for a bit. You returned on Monday or Tuesday? Nothing like that. Um... I mean, when when things get heated around here, because, you know, Christy gets pretty emotional and things get intense and she escalates things like like, for example, like, you know, on Friday, the you know, before February 10th, on that Friday before that, when I made the Amazon order, like I sent her an email saying like, um, you know, like things are not in a good place right now. And we should be realistic that this wedding on May 1st, probably, you know, maybe it's not going to happen and we should focus on the relationship and set that aside. And then, you know, the next day she sent me an email where she basically, you know, she's threatening to leave. She was, she had to uh, move out and she was going to start packing her stuff. So it's like an escalation. So it's like, you know, every time things would escalate and get emotional, I would, go for a walk or something or go drive to a park and get some food gone for a day or so that they couldn't find you. you no, no, never more than never over. Well, I was going to say never overnight, but then there's one time that I did go for a walk at like 2 AM because I couldn't sleep and I accidentally locked myself out. So I was walking around Elgin until Christy woke up in the morning. Other okay. than that, that was the longest I've been away from the house. Okay. I've never disappeared completely, you know, like if people are texting me, I respond. I've never disappeared as, as an attorney, you know, with that, um, voluntary commitment form, having a completely false justification, like, is there some way for me to get that tossed or something? Well, I, I because I represent the city of Elgin, I can't give you legal advice. Uh, you know, I'll try to be as accurate as I can in the facts and, uh, we'll go from there. And, and like I said, once it's done, you can ask for a copy of it. I'm, I have nothing to hide from you, sir. Okay. You saw, though, how he basically lied and said that because I signed that form at Glen Oaks, I was not forced to go to Sherman Hospital the day before, so therefore my complaint is unfounded. Didn't even address whether the information that they were acting on was false or not, just that they didn't force me to go, even though the language he used in the complaint clearly indicated that I was forced. They did not give me a choice. But he had that, that form that I provided to him only because I wanted to get his advice about the false justification that they use on that form. And not only that, but like I gave him a lot of documents 
because I was sitting there waiting what seemed like forever. You know, the police, Elgin police said on their website that the, the investigation would be completed in 30 days. He didn't interview me until probably like 60 days later or something like that. But, um, I was desperately trying to find some attorney that would talk to me because I think all the attorneys in Illinois know once you're classified as a suicidal subject, you have no rights. So there would be no case. No judge in Illinois would side with me for pretty much anything, I guess. So I was trying to get, since he was supposed to be an independent investigator and an attorney, I was trying to get some kind of feedback about stuff so I would give him some documents that maybe doesn't directly relate to whether the Elgin Police Department did something wrong. Oh, low battery. But he simply attached everything, claimed that I said everything showed some wrongdoing on the police, which was completely false. But then he attached everything I sent to him on the report, whether he referenced it or not, including some personal medical information, just to show him that I didn't show on the inpatient or the couple's therapy intake that I had a history of suicide attempts. But he attached everything regardless, with no regard to my privacy or whether it's relevant or anything, just to try to frame me as a crazy person that's sending all these emails. But I contacted Stephen Denalfo to point out his error, even showed him the video of his own interview. He said he stands by the report. I tried contacting Chief Anna Lally and Deputy Chief Adam Schusler, provided them both with parts of that interview that shows that he lied. They wouldn't acknowledge it, wouldn't even respond to me. Let's see, I uh, submitted a HIPAA request to Suma Karandikar for my medical records. There was no mention of any suicide attempt anywhere in my medical records. did maybe give me some insight into what happened that day on February 10th, 2021. But take it with a grain of salt. I think there's some bullshit behind it, but because like she seemed satisfied when she got off the phone with me that I wasn't suicidal. So what changed her mind? Well, in my medical records, she claims that she discussed it with some other therapist in her practice that works under her. And that other therapist basically changed her mind because I did make that Amazon order. Now, that doesn't really make much sense to me because that other therapist doesn't know any facts about the case. Why would you consult that other therapist that works under you? What, is she a legal expert or something? I mean, doesn't make any sense. I mean, why wouldn't she consult Don, the person that actually had direct observation of me Why wouldn't Don call himself? Why would she call for Don and create that game of telephone where you add that one extra link, that one extra disconnect? Well, probably because she is a licensed therapist and Don is not. So then that goes back to escalating credibility. You don't want the police to ignore you because you're an unlicensed therapist, then 
just have a licensed therapist relay everything you want to say. Um, so as you, you heard in that interview, I was trying to get those documents from Sherman because all I got was the ER notes, some kind of certificate or something. And I had to file a complaint for a HIPAA violation because they were just ignoring me, Sherman Hospital at that point, when I was trying to get these records. But months later, I did finally get those documents. I don't think they had anything informative on them, except those documents did include that risk assessment form, which Dr. Roland Liang forged. But I would talk to Chief Anna Lally personally and Deputy Chief Adam Schusler. And I try to say, like, no, that's false. That's simply stated as a fact, not only in the police report, but in the clear and present danger form as well. But it's not true. And Chief Anna Lally would be trying to, like, gaslight me about it or something. Like, well, that's just your opinion. Like, what competing opinion about, is there, about what my intention was in the privacy of my own home, like a decade earlier? What, like, some unlicensed couples therapist is giving his opinion based on some secondhand account? from Christy based on my telling of this story which she was completely ignoring and that's supposed to be an equally credible opinion about what happened in my life so yeah Chief Anna Lally is totally clueless But she would say, oh no, we'll just, uh, we'll go and check the body cam footage to see if you said that. Like, no, I didn't say that. I've checked the body cam footage. I know I didn't say that. I knew I didn't before I checked the body cam footage. I wouldn't say that because that never happened. But I think it was just a stall tactic because it was like, okay, we'll review that body cam footage and get back to you in a week. So they were trying to disprove me, to prove that not only that I had a history of suicide attempts, but I, I had said that myself, which is fucking insane. But when they failed to disprove me, I mean, you'd think they would do something because why go through that effort if no matter what, you're not going to do shit anyway? But that's exactly what they did. They didn't do shit. Even though that is a crime, by the way. In the state of Illinois, it is a crime to cause information you know to be false to be transmitted to the police. The law does not say that you have to report it yourself for it to be a crime. Just if you cause information you know to be false to be reported, that is a crime. And Christy and I both agreed to mandatory reporting requirements before we began couples therapy. So she should have known, 
reporting false information like that about me to a mandatory reporter could very well cause that false information that she knew to be false to be transmitted to the police since they are mandatory reporters. So that is a crime that was committed against me by Christie. Now maybe that might be hard to prove that she knew it was false or even that she reported it because of um, patient confidentiality. Uh, speaking about patient confidentiality, we also signed another agreement that said that anything that we disclosed to the couples therapist could be disclosed to the other. So it's a no secrets policy. So they could refuse to report, you know, what Christy said to the police to protect her privacy because she has that patient confidentiality. But there was no obligation that they had to keep that secret from me. That was their discretion to keep that false accusation a secret, even though they went on to report that to the police without any ex explanation where that came from so that the police would assume that I said that in therapy. But I guess I should say at this point that Suma, or not Suma, um, Chief Anna Lally and the Elgin Police Department and their records department, nobody would verify that Suma had actually made that accusation. So it's everywhere, it's only Chad Benavidez stating as a fact. Nowhere does it say that Suma Karandikar had reported that. And in that body cam video that you saw, it did originally contain the phone call with Suma, but they had redacted that for me. They removed the audio for that phone call. And Chief Anna Lally personally told me that they would not disclose the identity of their informants. Even though I told her that it was false, that their informant is lying, but she still protected their informant and whoever committed that crime against me. because I knew that it is unethical for a therapist, even a couples therapist, even a couples therapist supervisor to report information about you, which they did not gather from direct observation of you. But I'm sure she could probably say, oh, well, I was just relaying it from Don. That was Don's direct observation. It wasn't a direct observation. There was no direct observation to me that would have led him to that false conclusion. But even if you're reporting your opinion about a therapy session that you were not in, then they are ethically required to base their opinion on documentation. They can't just relay something verbally. It has to be documented. And like I said before, there was nothing like that documented in any of my medical records. So either she was withholding my medical records from my HIPAA request, where she was reporting information from Christie's medical records, which clearly when then was not a direct observation of me. But 
I submitted a complaint to the Illinois Department of Professional and Financial Regulations because that is who holds licensed professionals accountable in the state of Illinois. They're supposed to anyway. And I submitted all my medical records, all, everything that SUMA provided to me. You know, it should be an open and shut case. She made that accusation. She can't back up that accusation. But weeks went by and eventually it was assigned to an investigator. They use that term very loosely because she basically just said that, oh, I just collect information for it and on. And like, she didn't even collect any information. I, I gave it to her myself. But she got back to me and was like, oh no, you're, you're uh, you know, we're not gonna take your case because SUMA provided us with documents that showed that she was justified in reporting that information. And of course, I immediately was like, what documents? I don't have those documents. There's no such documents that she provided me with my HIPAA request. So let me know what documents I'm missing so I can include that in my HIPAA complaint. And then she's like, oh no, sorry, I misspoke. It was the documents that you submitted that we reviewed. And then I'm like, well, those documents don't justify the accusation of a false suicide attempt. So why are you not taking the case then? And she, re she replied with this uh, kind of long convoluted letter was trying to make me fuck off where she basically said, no, we're not taking your complaint. There could be various reasons for that. But we can't go into those reasons for confidentiality reasons. But the only reason there'd be any confidentiality concern would be to protect the confidentiality of another patient. Because SUMO has no confidentiality for me as far as my medical records. And obviously I don't have confidentiality for myself, so anything about me they could disclose. So the only way that they would have confidentiality concerns is if it was records about another patient that were used to justify reporting that false accusation about me. But that would be a clear ethical violation of the same ethics that they are supposed to be enforcing because that is not reporting information based on direct observation of me if they have to cite records of another patient. But ultimately the impression I got was that my complaint would go nowhere because I can't prove that SUMA actually made that accusation because it's only stated as a fact by Chad Benavidez, with Chad Benavidez never indicating where that came from. And I never got that phone conversation. And I did submit a Freedom of Information Act appeal with I think the, the, the Illinois Attorney General. Trying to figure out why I wouldn't have rights to information that a therapist is reporting about me. And first, 
they kept on saying, oh, and we can't do anything because our email got hacked. And then like several months later, I was like, I still haven't heard anything about this appeal. And then they say, oh, sorry, someone accidentally put that in the wrong pile. Someone incorrectly put that in the pile of invalid appeals. So I think they just wanted to ignore me. So they just tossed it, thinking that I wouldn't follow up or something. And then when I did follow up, it's like, oh, but we don't actually have a legitimate reason to just ignore his appeal. But essentially, they just kicked it back to Elgin. And Elgin just, uh, you know, and they said, oh, yeah, Elgin will give you an explanation. Well, I don't think they ever did. They just gave me an explanation for why they couldn't give me an explanation. Okay, so this is my last drone battery, so I'll try to wrap things up. <clears throat> but something I don't think I covered yet is um, in the clear and present danger form, I mean, Chad Benavidez seems to conflate Don with Suma. So when Don talked to someone, it just refers to them as Suma. But um, in the days were messed up too. Like, you know, it said that Suma had called me on Tuesday. Like, no, I never heard from Suma until Wednesday, like an hour before they showed up. But um, the clear and present danger form shows that Suma had indicated that she wanted me to get inpatient treatment, but she didn't indicate that she was worried I would kill myself. She said that Christy was worried that I would kill myself, but that Christy wanted to be anonymous. But when I got my medical records from Glen Oaks, there was one little piece of information buried in 800 pages of documents where Christie was actually interviewed. And in this interview, this phone interview, Christie had indicated that she did not believe I would harm myself because I never actually harmed myself before. Now, I wish they would have used more precise language because, I mean, the medical professionals seem to use like self-harm and suicide attempt kind of interchangeably, but it kind of sounds to me like Christy was admitting there was no previous suicide attempts. Just days after, she's reporting to Don Rossoff, referred to as Suma on the clear and present danger form, Not only that, I have a history of suicide attempts, but that she was worried that I would kill myself. But she confirmed in that phone call that she wasn't actually worried I would kill myself, but that she was guilty. But I don't know if it was clear that she was guilty because she previously had indicated I had tried to kill myself or she seemed to blame my situation on her threatening to move out, which was obviously a bluff because you know, I was desperately trying to get the facts because I mean, I'm trying to figure out if I should stay with Christy 
but obviously if she's lying behind my back making up suicide attempts in couples therapy, that would be a problem. That's something I should know before making a decision, but they are keeping me in the dark. Not only that, but I mean, had already told her back in 2016 that if she did exactly what she did, our relationship would be over. And I wasn't bluffing, I don't bluff, I don't play games, and I don't lie. But eventually, you know, obviously Chrissy wasn't gonna tell the truth, and when it seemed like I wasn't gonna get the truth from anyone else, I just told her, you know, because I can't, I can't accuse her because then that'd just be a fight. So instead of accusing her, even though I know damn well it was her, I told her that unless somebody takes responsibility and puts the truth on record, we couldn't stay together any longer. And she tried telling me like, what if I said something, but I don't remember it? Like, I think I told her that'd be even worse. Like, that's not very confidence inspiring that you're gonna report false information like that to a mandatory reporter and then not even remember it? So she is kind of changing stories on me. You know, at first she alluded to that recording existing, but then saying she didn't report anything. I mean, once I saw that police report, I went to her and was like, what is this suicide attempt? And she played dumb, like, I don't know what that's about. Even though when I first got to the hospital, she was trying to tell me I had a suicide attempt, but, but even after I told Chrissy, like, nobody takes responsibility, then we can't stay together. But I was still pursuing all avenues I had. I was talking to attorneys and stuff, trying to figure out how I can make the truth matter, get the truth on record. Because I mean, the police report is bad enough, but the clear and present danger form, that is now in the FOIA database forever. And maybe I don't live in Illinois anymore, but the fact that that state is keeping that lie about me on record and how offensive that lie is to me because I was living my whole life to specifically not do something like that and try to kill myself without exhausting all my options. But then on top of that, I know that lie is coming from that one person that I loved and trusted and want to build a life with and now that lie is being weaponized against me just in case I should try, I should end up living in Illinois again and try to exercise my Second Amendment right. Nope, Christie said, not even, no, Chad Benavidez said I had a history of suicide attempts, so better safe than sorry, we better not let him have a gun. Ah, this is annoying. Private property in the middle of the desert on a trail. But, so I talked to all the attorneys that would actually talk to me, complaint with the Illinois Department of Professional Financial Regulations, complaint with the police. I tried everything. Like this is the last thing I could come up with. Try to make the truth matter, but I doubt this will change anything because nobody really seems to care. And I mean, the whole FOIA database thing, I mean, that's obvious attempt to bypass the 14th Amendment and avoid any due process in the court of law so they could just infringe on your constitutionally protected right with any arbitrary information 
that someone like Chad Benavidez chooses to report as a fact. But I have been pursuing this issue relentlessly for over two years. Oh yeah, in December, I had the epiphany of taking a polygraph test. Just to prove that I have no history of suicide attempts. And I detailed that whole conversation with Christy that she recorded before I took that polygraph test. But the polygraph test just shows no history of suicide attempts. I didn't uh, t indicate to anyone that I was going to kill myself. And I never, I think there was one question that I never uh, took pills for the purpose of ending my life or something like that. So you know I'm telling the truth because of the polygraph test. Even though I don't have that recording of Christie's, if I had the full unedited recording, then I'd be able to disprove it because I think even though she stopped recording before I explicitly spelled that out, but I think it was already clear prior to that. But I'm sure Chrissy has deleted that full recording since then, since it is kind of incriminating for her. Chief Anna Lally gave her plenty of time to cover up her crime. But I think I've done everything I possibly could do. to stop being haunted by this terrible lie. I don't want to say vicious, I'll sound like Donald Trump. I've also tried, you know, other things to improve my life situation. Trying to exhaust all my options like I have. Therapy isn't an option anymore because I don't have that trust in the mental health institution anymore because those ethical guidelines that I was relying on in order to have faith, to have trust, whoa, in the therapist, you know, it's not an individual therapist trust, it's an institution that allowed me to even do therapy before. But now I realize those ethical guidelines, those ethical rules don't mean anything when they're being protected as a confidential informant because it's on you to prove that they violated those ethical guidelines and you can't if they're being protected by the police. So I was naive to ever trust any therapist. But even then, you know, when I first moved out to Pahrump, I contacted a therapist and, you know, asking more information about, you know, informa false information being reported. And of course she gives me the same spiel that everyone gives me, that everyone gives patients about mandatory reporting requirements. But I'm like, no, my, my issue is whether mandatory reporting is triggered or not. If you report false information, what is my recourse? And she didn't really have an answer for me. And even then later, I tried going to better help and I had the appointment scheduled, but uh, she asked four questions like before our session and one of them was like, have you ever tried, attempted suicide? And of course I said, no, I even have a polygraph to prove it. And then another question was, have you ever had a plan? And I was just like, no comment. You know, I'm not gonna answer that question so she can make blanket judgments against me without even talking to me 
and getting an idea from my personal individual situation. You know, the human mind is too complicated to just summarize it up in a few checkboxes. But she was like, no, no, you got to answer those questions. Otherwise, we can't do a therapy session. And I realized then, you know, yeah, I probably could have found another therapist that don't have that, those screening questions. But that's not the point. That was just a stark reminder to me that any therapist is going to be constantly looking for any excuse to, you know, mandatory report or whatever, regardless of whether it's in your interest or not, to cover their ass because they don't want to get stuck with the liability if you do actually do something. And if they do report, there's no accountability for what they report at all. So therapy wasn't an option, but you know, I, I had taken a break from racing let all the dust settle, but I got back into racing slowly. I was able to do that safely, thankfully. Um, I got a toy hauler so I could go on some cool off-road adventures that you see in some of these videos on my channel. I mean, obviously, I moved to Nevada, which, you know, to help mitigate some of the harm caused by all of this drama and bullshit and to get away from not just Christie's one lie, but any other lie she may be telling, you know, in racing paddocks in the Midwest or whatever. Also, I always want to get out of the Midwest just for, you know, better climate and everything, but. Also, I like being in a small town. Small town life suits me well, but, um, And I made a video about this before, but I got a dog too. But I've been pursuing every single option I could think of to make my life better, to make my life more manageable. Like I decided I would, you know, 16 years ago, over 16 years ago, I think. And I've been pursuing that ever since. But I feel like now, for the first time, I'm confident in saying that I have exhausted all of my options. You know, I talked to attorneys, I talked to everybody, because this one lie of Christie's, this false accusation of some suicide attempt, has been the most troubling, most detrimental to my mental health for the past two plus years and will continue to be probably for the next decade I think it's safe to assume at least but just like before with college I don't want to get you know tunnel vision so I've been pursuing other things as well including my physical health but I feel like I've exhausted all my options this is my life now because of Chief Anna Lally's game of telephone and the way false information can be reported in the state of Illinois and used against you without due process to infringe on your constitutional rights. And even if I have my rights here in Nevada, it's still bothers me a lot, weighs heavily on my emotional well-being, even here in Nevada. And even after my polygraph test, they still won't say the truth on record. It's still just Chad Benavidez making that false statement as a fact. No correction 
as a fact. Just, I want that ignored. And then they attached my police report in another supplemental report. Of course, that detective also lied about something else, trying to put words in my mouth that I never said. So it's just this pattern of deception in Chief Anna Lally's police department. Every step of the way, it seems like they can't help themselves before false information. But this is my life now. I've exhausted all my options. So I guess now I just have to choose. This is my life, take it or leave it. So I guess I have a decision to make. And I'll allow some time to see if this video does make a difference. Maybe, you know, hoping to realize some therapeutic benefit from having a dog. I don't want to make too hasty of a decision, although it's been over two years now, but, you know, I've still been trying some other stuff lately, but I have nothing else to try. So it's decision time coming up. But that's my story. Like and subscribe. Comment if you have any opinions or theories about what went down or who's responsible for what. Uh, please hold the thoughts and prayers. That doesn't do shit to make the truth matter. If you have any ideas for how I can make the truth matter and get the truth on record, by all means, comment. Especially if you're an attorney and you have any, any advice whatsoever. I'd appreciate it. Or anything you ha any ideas you have for me to make my life more manageable. But thank you for watching.